What is up, everybody on Twitch? Good evening. How are you? Welcome, guys, gals, non-binary pals, to another edition of chatting here on Twitch. Uh, my name is John. I am the Tattoo Historian. If you're new to the channel, thank you for being here. Welcome. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, tonight, I'm joined by Dr. Jonathan Jones. We're going to be talking about uh, gaming and how we may perceive the past through that medium, which is why we're on Twitch. What what better place to be doing this, right, Jonathan? Right, right. <laughs> uh, Jonathan's an assistant professor at Virginia Military Institute. Uh, previously in 2020, 2021, he was the inaugural postdoctoral scholar in Civil War history at Penn State's George and Ann Richards Civil War Era Center. Uh, he received his PhD in history in 2020 from Binghamton University. In the classroom, his teaching experience includes the Civil War era and the 19th century United States, the history of medicine and science, gender history, as well as history communication and teacher prep. Thank you again, Jonathan, for being on. I really do appreciate you. Yeah, excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. And this is the perfect venue for a conversation about games, right? Historical video games. Yeah, this is this is great. And and it's something we've been trying to do here on Twitch with this brand is connecting gaming with uh, historical memory and the idea of how we perceive history through gaming. So I this is a, a fantastic thing for us to discuss tonight. And uh, we we actually met on a panel. Yeah, <laughs> a, a digital history panel basically well, it was a digital history conference uh kind of thing for the university of southern mississippi yeah um, yeah was that was that last back in the summer right um of this last year everything's kind of a blur <laughs> i know everything is a blur it was it was this summer because i remember the the attic studio here being really hot nice, nice. so nice. Yeah. yeah yeah that was the summer and you and you and you chaired the panel or moderate yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. A, we had a we had a great conversation. We had, I think, um, a bunch of uh, people who are, um, you know, like people who have played video games, but also scholars who think about like the ways that you can use video games to to teach and to learn. So it was a fun conversation. Um, so it's good to keep it going. Yeah, we had we had uh, something I didn't expect, and I was I, I was kind of like, um, I thought I messed up with the thing because <laughs> everyone. A lot of people on the panel, there were uh, four people on the panel, I think, and, and you, John, yeah. five total. Uh, I think two or three of us or, uh, of us on the panel were talking about gamification of the classroom, and yeah. I'm sitting there talking about gaming on Twitch to introduce yeah. people to the historical narrative. And I felt terrible because I'm like, hold <laughs> it. Did I not do my homework or what is <laughs> what is going on? So I think it's good for us, Jonathan, to start out by talking to people about uh, what – gaming is to us as historians and how that's different than gamification in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, I think it's, I think you're right. And I remember there were sort of like two kind of parallel conversations happening um, yeah. because people get really confused um, about the difference between like, you know, historical video games, which is like one thing and gamification when, when you teach and that's like a whole other thing. So I think of gamification as like turning something into a game um, in order to teach people how to do it. Like I used to, um, back in the day, back in my, in my past life, <laughs> I used to, I used to be a high school teacher and I taught this one, one semester I taught, um, economics. And so I thought, you know, a cool way to do it would be to play this thing called the stock market game, which was mm -hmm. like where, I mean, it is what it sounds like. It's like, it takes, you know, basic, like, stock market um, principles and you learn how to do it by playing with fake money through a game. And it was cool. I mean, it, that's gamification. You, you turn it into a game, basically. Um, some of my students made became fake, fake billionaires. Like, <laughs> in the course of three months. I wish I was that good at it. Yeah. <laughs> they had me beat. But that's what I think of as gamification, right? right. And that's yeah. a different thing than, than what we're talking about, which is historical video games, right? Right, yeah. I, I went into that panel and then afterward with some of my presentations with the uh, idea I was putting the lens on of uh, a historian who has heard other historians in the past say video games have nothing to do with history. They, they have no place in it and they fight against it. And mm -hmm. I'm going into it saying this is a multi-billion dollar industry and yeah. we as historians cannot fight that. We have to kind of try to embrace it, right? Because it's not going to go away. It's never going to go away. There, historians are also gamers as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so I think that it's great to embrace it, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, gaming is is bigger than Hollywood um, already, and it's it's only getting bigger, right? Um, I think the the I was reading this this thing a, a couple weeks ago that said that something like eighty percent of Americans play some kind of video game every day, right? Whether it's like on your Xbox um, or on your on your iPhone or, or or your iPad or whatever. So yeah, we're all we're all gamers, and and even people who don't think of themselves as being gamers like fall into those categories, right? But I, I do think, like you said, like a lot of the resistance um, in like, uh, you know, among college professors and, and historians to gaming is just the fact that I think sometimes people don't realize that they are gamers. So when they hear, you know, the word gamer, they're like, oh, gross, you know, <laughs> yeah. that yeah. nasty thing that, that teenagers do, right? But it's it's not, right. you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, and and uh, uh, good evening to everyone who's joining us. Uh, Pit History Guy, thank you for the sub. And then Tim Dayer, thank you for the follow. Pit History Guy's in the chat, and they are actually playing board games while they are listening to us. Nice, nice. What are we so, playing? So uh, two playing Vietnam Strategic and two playing 1944 France Tactical, which yeah. this is perfect for what we're talking about because when we, talk, when we talk about gaming, it doesn't have to be video gaming. Yeah. And that way it can also be board gaming, and that is huge among uh no no offense pit history guy <laughs> board gaming uh, in that way and, and is historical board gamers tend to be a, skew a little bit older hmm. and they are the older historians who have been in it for a while who are also now teaching the younger historians uh younger historians are the ones who grew up with like the nintendo <laughs> nes or even super nes or whatever we tend to gravitate towards video gaming yeah. Uh, with an appreciation of board gaming. But that has a huge influence on how we see the past as well or how we interpret the past. Yeah, totally. I mean, I got into, like, part of the reason why I'm a historian is because of video games. Like, I grew up playing, um, you know, like you and like like a lot of other people and probably most people who are watching, I grew up playing history video games, which is one of the biggest genres of video games, right? Like, it's as big as sci-fi or, or, or fantasy. So, like, I would play... Um, uh, uh, well, Oregon Trail obviously was one. I remember oh, yeah. that. You can you can actually go and play like the 1984 version of Oregon Trail on um, archive.org. So if anybody <laughs> if oh, anybody God. is watching that didn't grow up, that's too young to have grown up playing Oregon Trail. <laughs> a, I'm I'm jealous, and B, you can actually play it and, and live that history for yourself. The history wow. of playing the game while you're pretending to be in Oregon in the 1840s. <laughs> yeah, and they just they just released a new version of that. Oh, really? Of Oregon Trail. And they've actually, talking about this thing we're talking about tonight, they have updated it to include more indigenous voices. That's good. Yeah. And some other things. So you're starting to see the historical memory uh, aspect of this mm. starting to come into play, where uh, literally come into play, where it's like, hey, we want to have indigenous voices in this because they were a part of this experience and we didn't have it in the original. Right. Yeah. And I think that's great. And I think that the more games, the more gamer, the more game development companies that start doing that, the better. And I think that, um, you know, it's like, it's like I tell my students the way, you know, history isn't just straightforward facts. Right. It's not just a Wikipedia article. It's also there's like interpretations involved. So people who write history books make and also people that, that make games like people who make Red Dead Redemption 2 or Oregon Trail. They make choices about what stories to tell, like what gets left in and what gets left out. And so I think the more uh, of the, the story that um, has gotten left out before, the more that we put that back in, the better. So that's good to hear. I actually just saw I was at Target yesterday and I saw an Oregon Trail card game. So it's like <laughs> Oregon Trail is going backwards to um, <laughs> board games now too. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah. yeah, that that really um, impacted me in that it started. Uh, I was an Oregon Trail hmm. person. Uh, we, we I played in elementary school on like an Apple II GS or whatever. It was floppy yeah. disk. So I'm dating myself here. Um, <laughs> but that really impacted me with why are these people, you know, taking a wagon and hmm. why why do they need these provisions or what why do they need this you know whatever. On, on, on board and it really made me think about human experience. Hmm. And I know that's way too technical usually for a 10 year old or an eight year old to be thinking about that stuff. But I think that's why young historians can gravitate towards those things because I know when I've gone out and I've done interpretive experiences, I can tell the kids who play World War II games hmm. because of how they talk about weaponry or uniforms or whatever it may be. 
and it's really um, a good gateway drug in a for way sure. for some for some people. Yeah, totally. And I mean, that was my that was me when I was a kid. I grew up playing. Uh, my favorite game was this game called Civil War Generals Two. I don't know if anybody. Oh, yeah, uh, the best, right? And yes. I, I swear, if I could get it yes. running on the machine right now, I would be literally playing it while while we're talking. Yeah, this and Sid uh, Meier's Gettysburg was the one. Yeah, Sid yeah. Meier's Gettysburg was great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, those games were amazing, and that's like what what made me you know i was like aware of the the civil war era and i specialize in that as a story in the u.s civil war era right and uh -huh. so i was like vaguely aware that that had happened but i wasn't super into it and so I was, until those games became like my gateway drug like you said so it was for me that was a really good experience and i know of a ton of other historians who are about our age that had the same experience so this is like a mainstream way to get into history right uh -huh. do you think, think jonathan do you think there's a uh what do you think are some of the negatives mm. if, if if you you know because i know we've heard a lot about negative and positive with this what are your personal views on the negative aspects if you see any yeah i think um yeah that, so so this goes back to like what stories get left out i think back to like the games that really got me into to the to the u.s civil war era like interested in it and the things that i got interested in were the things that the game made you work hard to do. Like in um, uh, uh, Civil War Generals 2, you had to like manage your your, your dude's supplies, like their, their bullets, and you had to like upgrade their weaponry and um, maintain their like energy levels like that. And so those were the parts of the Civil War that I got really, really, really honed in on until I was like in, in, in grad school, basically. So those are the parts of the Civil War that I got obsessed with. I think in, in my case, at the exclusion of the big, the bigger parts of the story too, which are like the issues that the Civil War was about, like the causes and effects and things like that. So I think sometimes if games are too narrowly focused, then um, it can it can give people like tunnel vision, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other hand, it it is you know games are are meant to be fun to play, right? So you you can't have every game being extremely like heavy in the the content. Um, so it's this really weird balance that I think game developers have to have to meet. Um, so that's what I think of as the downsides. What about what about you? You've heard a lot of this too. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard a lot about it. Uh, I've heard a lot about this issue uh, within the last decade or so, especially with games which deal with, let's say, English colonialism. Yeah. Um, I've heard this with uh, Victoria, which is a great series, and that. Uh, but it it kind of glosses over some of the issues with colonization and it doesn't give you the aspect of when you're moving a force into let's say Africa you're not getting the African point of view of right. what's happening at that time so uh, you know it makes sometimes games like that can make uh, this white centric view of the world come through in various ways and you don't even realize it until you think about it later. Right. Uh, I mean, it, it was very easy to move a pawn around risk yeah, <laughs> and to overtake these countries for certain reasons, but it's like, it's so much more yeah. you know, difficult to do this than just rolling a dice. However, you're absolutely right where it's like, we need to make this fun. We can't be turning people off from these yeah, things. Yeah. But it's when we take that and say, oh, it'll be so easy to do X, Y, Z in the real world because of... Right. What we've been shown in game. Uh, I mean, look how many people, you know, you know, dress up like they're going to battle and, and walk around town. And it's like, yeah, that's this isn't Call of Duty, right. <laughs> you know. And I think that's where the negative comes out, where we get this idea that because we're good in game, we'd be good in life at these issues. And I think we, we put on this kind of it's it's similar to when I used to reenact mm. Jonathan, where we'd be doing a, a mock battle. And I know people hate when I use the term mock uh, battle because they're like, are you saying it's a mockery? And I'm like, it, ask the originals, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, but we do the battle and people take hits and everything else. And then everybody gets up and everybody claps. Right. And I've always wondered if that creates a disconnect yeah. between the real cost. And I, th I think that from time to time when we're, when we're gaming as well, is there a disconnect here um, with the overall picture? Like you said, what, we don't have a game about the secession crisis. 
right? <laughs> you know, uh, try to prevent South Carolina from seceding or something. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the, the Call of Duty mentality that you get, like, first of all, I'm a huge fan of Call of Duty, right? I love Call of Duty. I've played them all. Um, I grew up playing every entry in the, the franchise all the way up until the latest one, which which was like 80 bucks. So it was like way too expensive. But, yeah. Uh, and it took way too long to download, but that's a whole other, <laughs> a whole other thing, <laughs> yeah. right? But yeah, they do. They do put you in this sort of mentality about, um, like, like, like the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example. Like, if you, I remember um, when, uh, like, around, you know, when maybe Call of Duty Modern Warfare Two came out, there were a lot of people. Which I can't remember what year that was, but it's been a while. It's been a while, um, yeah. There were a lot of so the U.S. was like still involved really heavily in Iraq, right? And there were a lot of people that were like, "Wait a second, this game looks like Iraq. Are we are we like by playing the game without asking any of the big questions about what actually motivate um, wars? Does that mean that we're like applauding war without thinking about it critically?" So it was like there, there's just a lot of big issues involved in these games. They're fun to play, but you do have to think about some of these things when you're playing them. Uh, yeah, and I think it really showcases us as historians, where sometimes people don't like to watch movies with us yeah. because we 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 were like, this isn't the whole picture, or yeah. these this isn't right, or whatever. We're and cynical we're, people, right? Yeah, and then we're still we're still doing it when we're like gaming. Yeah. We're like, well, you know, why yeah. are we even here? <laughs> you know, we can't even sit back and, and enjoy blockbuster games, right? Because we're just right. like questioning everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, for everyone who's watching, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate you hanging out with myself and, and Dr. Jonathan Jones here. Uh, I hope that I do not lose power because we are getting struck with a heavy thunderstorm right now. So if we suddenly go dark, uh, you'll know that I lost power. So stick with us. We're going to go, we're going to get through all this. Um, uh, thank you, John T. Crow for being here. Really appreciate you. She's also gaming. She's, she's staying safe and doing Mario Kart 64. Yes. So that's, that's good. <laughs> Uh, Pit History Guy, why don't play first-person shooter American Civil War? Realistic likelihood would be dying of disease and killing no enemy. Yeah. 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 We, and there is a uh, World War One game coming out mm -hmm. next year, which re you run a field hospital. No so, you're, so you're not actually doing a first-person shooter. You are like a doctor who's in charge of a hospital, and you have to uh, set up trauma units and stuff like that. So that's going to be a really interesting take on history. Yeah, that's that's intense. It reminds me of a Wii game that came when you would buy a Wii, like back in the first, a Nintendo Wii, like in the first run of it, they would ship those free like Wii game discs with it. And one of them in, in the Wii that we got at my house had was like a surgeon game and you had to use the Wii remote to do surgery. Oh, wow. I didn't get that. In the history book on that would be good. But yeah, I mean, the, in the Civil War, this is kind of like what we were talking about, like the things that get left out of Sid Meier's um, Antietam, right, back in the day, or, or ACW today, like the, you know, two thirds of the people that died in the US Civil War of disease, right? Gangrene right. and, you know, malaria and, you know, having extreme diarrhea, right? So it's right. like, these are, these are yeah. things that aren't fun to put in video games. Um, at least no one's found a way to make them fun yet, but they're yeah. really yeah. important parts of, of war, which is the main subject material for history of video games, so. Yeah, and there, and we are constantly uh, seeing more and more games coming out that have that first-person shooter mentality, and uh, it's almost like when we studied history back in the day, and it seemed like history was one war after another war, and we just jumped from war to war, not realizing stuff happened in between it as well, and yet games also emulate that. Right. Where when we talk about historical gaming people. And I'm guilty of this here on Twitch and our places. I'm usually playing a military game. I'm usually playing, yeah. you know, World of Warships or War Thunder or something like that. When in actuality, there's a ton of other stuff we could be working on here. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I, you know I do the same. Like I said, I play all these all these games that I love to bash. I I play them too, you know, and I I love I enjoy playing them. Um, but yeah, it's it's a weird it's a weird headspace to be in sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know that there's one uh, that's on my wish list now, where you're like a 1920s era. Um, uh, you're running alcohol during Prohibition in New York City, and you have to set up a supply chain and do all this other stuff. So it's like, okay, this is going to be some kind of cool interwar period, pre-depression era thing of, of of doing that. So we are starting to see some more of the 
non-military based history games again coming out um uh, especially from independent creators developers but still not to the you know part where we could have it yeah you know? yeah i'd love to see more of that in the in the future like more games set in topics that you in historical topics that you wouldn't expect to see uh, a big game or, or an indie game like depict um and yeah. actually that's i think i think games are getting better and better i do think that that um even big studios are doing a better job these days of of depicting sort of the non-typical content that that like your non-call of duty type content like um Red Dead Redemption 2, um, there's all kinds of, you know, you know, it is this um, like really classical Western game, you know, it's got all the, the stuff that you would expect from a Western um, video game or, or Western shooter. Like you've got your, 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 your main guy and he's, you know, on the run, he's, his gang is like in trouble and, you know, all the stuff that you would, you would expect from a Western, but you've right. also got like um, people dying of disease since we just mentioned disease, you've got like, uh all kind like um there's a cholera I, one of my favorite moments in rdr2 is when you just like randomly stumble across a town that's got a cholera epidemic going on oh, and i mean yeah. like, people that have like visible cholera going on and there's like posters all over the town that say like don't come here we have cholera and mm -hmm. those are the kinds of moments that i think are really cool in the latest generation of of big games like that um, that's that's my favorite part finding those little historical nuggets that make you wonder about actual cholera epidemics yeah, that's that's really cool. I'm glad they put that in there, and I I forgot about that until you said that. That's that's a really cool touch, and it, and it overlaps a lot of different types of history. Hmm. You know, we can then go into medical history and and stuff yeah. like that. With you working with uh, VMI yeah. uh, students, uh, have you encountered things in the classroom with them, which leads back to their time uh, in front of a screen, or uh, is that is that not come up yet it's so so i just started a couple weeks ago but so right. so you would think that it hadn't come up yet but it actually has i mean all of my um uh, most of my cadets grew up playing video games just like just like me um, even though i'm older than them um it's like a multi-generational thing now at this point so they they've definitely had the same experiences like if you mention um you know i mentioned uh red dead redemption 2 the other day that i would like love to i'm like i just keep going on and on about this game but that's what i'm playing right now um, again <laughs> you can tell what someone's playing when yeah you, you can always tell by how they talk right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um but i mentioned something i don't even remember what it was and oh it was we were talking about railroads and i was like i would love to see that happen on a train in red dead redemption 2 and everybody was like suddenly i'm awake right <laughs> you know, <laughs> right red dead so i want to talk about that <laughs> but yeah, we've I've had a few of those moments, and I think a lot of other other people teaching these days at any level have the same moments. It's um, mm -hmm. something that a lot of people want to talk about. People love video games, and a lot of the biggest games are history games. So it's a mm -hmm. natural way to to talk. Um, in the, it's a natural thing to talk about in the classroom. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where we see a lot of hardline traditional historians, at least I have, who have just put up a wall against it and said mm -hmm. there's nothing. There's nothing of value here. We can't do anything about it. It's not even a door to open curiosity, which I think is exactly what it is. It's a way to open that and spark that curiosity and get people interested. That's why I'm on Twitch. That's why I'm gaming and trying to create a space here for people to just be curious about the past or be the nerds that we are and hang out and chat and do all that. Uh, and then it's just like, well, we as historians need to come to the understanding that this is a bigger industry than than we are ever going to be yeah. <laughs> and and we could we take a vow of poverty when we become historians right. they're making billions of dollars and setting up venues to to do these things and to play call of duty like you say mm -hmm. and and they have arenas set up for this stuff and if we don't engage with those uh players if with those gamers what does that say about us because it's almost like we are doing exactly what we're studying we're living in the past here yeah i think it'd yeah. be really cool though to have that connection yeah and i think i think it's the same kind of thing that um the history profession like went through in the 80s with with film studies right like there's always been for for a long time you know there's been film studies people that um like you know in a scholarly way really study films but until like the the 1980s 1990s historians didn't do that historians kind of just ignored 
movies, which obviously movies are a central part of all of our lives since like the 1920s. And so um, I remember um, uh, like back in, back when uh, the movie Lincoln came out, which I think was in sometime in the, maybe like 2015 around, maybe I'm yeah, off yeah, like 2014 ish. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. There. there were a bunch of civil war historians that said that we shouldn't talk about the movie Lincoln, but it was like the thing that everybody wanted. It was like one of the biggest movies of the year. Everybody wanted to talk about it. And so it just seems kind of like malpractice almost to not to like ignore um, the things that, that other, other people want to talk about if, if, for pertains to history. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I yeah. Yeah. When I started the Twitch channel here, um, I got the same reaction from other more traditional historians oh. of why are you there? Our audience isn't there. And it was but the it same thing I got when I started a Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> why are you on Facebook? Our audience isn't yeah. there. Now look what happens with COVID where now they have to be live streaming. They right. have to podcast. They have to do all this. And it's almost like we as historians have to try to stay one step ahead. I mean, no one knew COVID was going to happen. No one knew we were going to go into lockdown. But yeah. I've been live streaming for years. Yeah. And so when that happened, uh, a couple of them came to me with their organization and said, I need to understand how to do this. I don't know how to live stream or whatever else. And I gladly showed them. And I'm wondering when the day is going to come when uh you know it's not going to happen with an nps site it's going to happen with a museum most likely or uh, or you know a, a history department at a, a vmi or or wherever else where they're saying we need to have a twitch channel or we yeah. need to have a gaming channel just in general because we need to reach out to those people who are going to be our next students yeah and and that kind of thing that's where my brain automatically went to jonathan when i was starting this was we need to impact the next generation who's already here um and i and i've received it in the in the comment section i'll be gaming away doing my thing and talking about university life or whatever that i've witnessed and there'll be someone in the chat who says how do i find a grad school yeah and it's yeah like, people yeah yeah and people uh i stumbled onto a like a reddit forum a while back where somebody was asking the same thing like how do i I want to go to a get into a PhD program, but I've never known anybody that like had a PhD or, or went to uh, grad school and I don't know any of my professors, so I don't know who to ask. And yeah, I mean, Twitch is like a natural uh, and, and other other sites, too. But these are like natural ways to, to make those conversations happen. Um, mm -hmm. it's, wild. Mm -hmm. it's wild. All the things that all the um, new like doors that are opened by um, technology and especially since COVID, as bad as COVID has been, I think the fact that a lot of a lot of places have started streaming things has been good for for people that are interested in history because you can see these things that you visit you used to have to physically go to um, right right yeah so, um, I, I, go, I, go ahead i was gonna say it's like getting cable for history all of a sudden <laughs> if anybody still has, yeah. if anybody still has cable out there <laughs> yeah uh it's it's been one of those things to where we can also showcase what we do when we're not in the classroom yeah for sure you know as as educators or as students or whatever else of history uh we don't have to do history all the time you know right. uh, I, I remember one night back in december of last year uh i got a bunch of us together and we just played like among us for two hours just a yeah. bunch of historians playing that and it's like see we we also are human yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> breaking down that ivory tower kind of mentality yeah, yeah, it's funny. I was, um, I went to my first. Uh, so, like I said, I just started at, at VMI a couple weeks ago, and we have this big, like, beginning of the year ceremony that's like a formal opening to the to the school year, right? So, at VMI, everybody wears uniforms, and so like military uniforms because it's a military school. Right. Um, and so it was the first time that I saw every uh, all of the the other faculty members not in uniform because they were all in those gowns, right? Those Harry Potter looking uh, <laughs> faculty gowns. Yeah like a totally different experience than what I'm used to. And it was kind of like all of a sudden I saw them as um, people and not as like, um, like, you know, people who teach at a military school. I'm not saying that very well, but I had one of those moments today. Yeah, no, yeah. I totally, I totally get that. I mean, could you imagine someone who uh, is in one of your classes and then they they find out like you're gaming online, Yeah, <laughs> you know, some night and they're like, wow, I didn't know Dr. Jones yeah. did that. That's You've got a double life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, as long as you're the same, uh, you know, pretty much the same. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I know in class you have to, you have to be a, a little bit more professional, but uh, I think we're getting to that point though, where the authenticity value for us is impacting how we see the past in general for, for those who are watching um, because we can have those conversations. Right. And, it, and it's, it really helps us to open new doors. And I think historical memory is constantly evolving yeah. and it could be evolving because, you know, of something we stream, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think speaking of, of memory always evolving, I think that's one of the things that has, uh, been driving big game developers the last few um, generations of, of major titles. Like I think back to, um, uh, you know, Oregon Trail, like like you mentioned a minute ago, and all the things that are not in Oregon Trail. Right. Um, and so that's back in the, the 70s and the 80s. And so there's like no Native Americans, there's um, hardly any um, other, other big themes in the era. Like there's no slavery, there's um, no uh, questions about like why the U.S. is expanding westward, so there's a lot missing, right? But right. then fast forward to other games that are set on the frontier made more recently, like I'm thinking of um, AC3, Assassin's Creed 3, which is set in the American Revolution, so different time period, but it's still set a lot of it on the frontier. And all, a lot of those themes are in AC3, like the main guy is a Native American and he interacts with other Native Americans. And there's um, there's even uh, there's even slavery in uh, Assassin's Creed Three. So like the the things that um, people have come to expect out of their history books, like more um, uh, diverse stories, um, more things that have been overlooked in the past that should now be be in these things. I think mm -hmm. game developers are starting to respond to that. Um, not everybody, not a, not a, not every historian agrees with the point that I'm making, but that's what I think. Um, I've noticed games becoming more. Um, in line with what uh, historians would hope that they that they be. Yeah, and, and I think it's a great point to a uh, great thing to point out as well that some of these, especially small developers, hmm. are now embracing historians to come on the team yeah. uh, at least part time and be an advisor and say, "Hey, what did this uh, person do in history, or what? How would this have worked, or whatever you know you want to put in, whatever your specialization is? How would this have worked in a historical narrative in a historical yeah. time period? And that's when you really realize that historians are more mainstream than a lot of historians want to admit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah. we're already involved in the gaming field. It's yeah. just that it's it's kind of overshadowed because developers. Uh, obviously, and for the right reasons, get most of the cred. It's it's brought out by this developer, it's it's disseminated by this person, and maybe you don't see the credits of the team, but there are historians or anthropologists or whoever in the credits. Yeah, and I think that's so cool, and I want to see more more and more of that. Like, I want that to be like every game, ha every historical game. I think should have a historic like a historian as a consultant in some way right because it's uh -huh. almost like um if you were to make a movie about uh the american revolution without having somebody who's a historian tell you what the uniforms looked like or like what people sounded like so i think i think um that's a good trend and i want to see more and more of that so um any if any if any game developers are out there <laughs> keep keep hiring historians or, or consulting historians yeah and if you're a historian who likes to game and yeah. you are in that younger age bracket, not my age, if you're like half my age and you are gaming and you are in undergrad or whatever it may be, now's the time to check out, you know, these developers and see, are they looking for people who, who have the history chops and do gaming yeah. um, and, and stuff like that? Because you might be more in demand than I was when I was 20, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and if you're if you're a history major, you know, or, or somebody somebody that's in grad school, you have research skills, and game developers need that. They need people to help um, provide content for scripts, right? They need people to help research um, the period that the game is is about, right? So you have like built-in skills that would be really good to connect with game developers. So I'd love to see more of that happening. Yeah, I've even heard of them uh, developers asking for people to come in who understand dialects nice historical dialects yeah. and stuff like that and i'm like well yeah because i know what growing up in south central pennsylvania i know there's a dialect here that's different than where you're at in, in you know southwestern 
uh, Virginia. Yeah. So, yeah, it'd be great if we get used to the southwestern Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're getting used to it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. See, I'm from Texas, and so I think over over time I've kind of lost my Texas accent. But in my mind, like the default accent is like a Texas accent. So any, <laughs> every time I switch locations, I just moved here from upstate New York, and there's a different accent there too. So every time I switch locations, I have to learn. A, that not everybody sounds like they're from Texas all over again, and B, I have to right. figure out how to understand <laughs> people in the place that, that I'm living in. So I could use yeah. some, somebody that's skilled at dialect. You're pretty hard on Virginia barbecue, I imagine. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we won't talk about that. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll do that in our stream. Yeah, that's another, um, a whole other conversation. Yeah, it's in our hour, at least, going on for that. Yeah. Um, something else I wanted to bring up uh, during this conversation was something that is piquing my interest and that is some of us in the history field are really looking hardcore at ar and vr experiences mm, yeah and and especially with vr yeah vr is easily accessible now more so than it was five years ago i mean For you sure. can go on your steam account and you can download it and you know put on your goggles and go to work and do whatever you literally go to work there's a game where it's a job uh you know thing and i'm like why would you want to I don't, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you think VR is going to impact our mm -hmm. field? Because now people can do like an Assassin's Creed thing and they can walk through Greece. They can walk through ancient Rome. Yeah. How do you think that's going to impact how we can bring the historical narrative across? Yeah. VR is the future, man. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's already here. So it's not even just the future. It's just that historians are arriving um, slower than, than other some other other fields and stuff, right? So right. for us, it's the future. For everybody else, it's the now. Um, but yeah, VR is. I mean, I mean, imagine you know you're studying something, um, you know that uh, like you're reading something out of a book, right? You're reading about ancient Greece. You don't know. Um, all, all you're getting is what you're you're reading from the page and your mind can imagine. But imagine, um, or like you know, instead of that, think of of being able to like put on VR goggles. And actually, be in ancient Greece, right? And to, to walk around and see um, what it what it feels like, and what it you know how people are moving and things like that. So it's a whole different. I mean, it's like a quantum leap forward. I think for teaching history, um, and also for for recreating history. Like um, there is um, a really cool project. I can't say too much about it because it's not public yet. But there's a really cool project um, at a university near here. Um, near near here in um, in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, where there's a team working on recreating in VR the um, uh, Constitutional Convention, like you know, oh, cool. people around the room where they're like writing the Constitution and debating it, and you can go walk around the room and see stuff and and interact with people that are there, like historical folks that are there. And I mean, I think that 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 to me, and I'm a, I'm a professional historian, but even to me, that sounds more interesting than reading about the Constitutional <laughs> Convention, right? So imagine. Right. What do for, for elementary school kids and high school kids and college students. So I think it's a big deal. Um, the problem is that a lot of historians, myself included, right? I'm no programmer. Um, I wish I wish I was good at these kinds of things, um, but I, I'm just not. And so the problem is that a lot of historians don't know how to how to do VR, right? So yeah. we have to be interdisciplinary. We have to like link up with um, game developers or with with other people on campus who have those skills. Um, which I think is something that's uh, a trend that we need to see more of. But anyways, that's what they're doing over at this other university um, that I'm talking about. There's there's like a, a team of historians and um, programmers who are working together on this project. It's that's really cool. cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, because I I have wished that I had a the funding and b the collaboration with someone to do some VR with my brand because I've had ideas about how we can do certain things. Uh, but this also goes, goes back to the way we are educated as historians. Mm -hmm. We are educated as historians mainly. I mean, uh, let me just put it this way. I was educated as a historian. I graduated with my grad degree in 2013. I didn't digitize anything. Mm -hmm. I wasn't taught to digitize anything. I wasn't taught digitization other than like yeah. defining the term. Right. So sure. I don't have any uh, experience uh, from my education end of it. I have, I have real world, mm -hmm. but I don't have experience from my educational end with formatting anything for digitization, mm -hmm. with creating those things like you're talking about. So I think it would be very, very beneficial for students if you want to have a minor or if you want to use an elective mm -hmm. 
-hmm. go towards one of those classes that allow you to understand how to code something or how to do something with uh, you know AR or or something to that effect go to a different department and get that elective because I could see you being in more demand uh, because this, as Jonathan was saying, this is the direction that we're, we're heading now. I mean, soon we're going to be, we'll have one for debating the Declaration of Independence or, or uh, you know, uh, being there at the Gettysburg Address, right. and stuff like that, where these major moments need to be brought into the VR hemisphere. And we as historians aren't trained to do it. How cool would it be if we had that training? And it's like, well, let's create this. It's going to take two years, but let's do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that also signifies how much we just need to network with people who do know how to do it. And sure. so we need to come out of our introvert shells and say, hey, I need some help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that's one of the things that you, uh, that gets like, um, that, that you sort of, one of the bad habits that you learn in grad school is when not to, is to not ask for help when you need it. Right. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I think, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I think I would love to see, um, a history like in like future history students starting now learn in the same way that we learn how to do, um, you know, archival research, like wrestling, wrestling around with papers and taking notes on what we find. And in the same way that other historians learn how to do, uh, how to design like uh, museum exhibits and things like that. Mm -hmm. I would love also for it to be a standard thing for, you know, most departments to offer, um, uh, historical game training in some capacity. Cause it's like, it's like, um, the, you know, not only is it the, the future, but it's the, the now I keep saying that, but this is an, an industry that's bigger than Hollywood. Right. And it's something right. people, you can go to target and buy, um, a VR, uh, headset. Right. So these are, these are things that are like happening, whether historians like it or not, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I have my, my VR headset over in the corner. Yeah. Um, uh, and I intend to do some stuff with historically based games as far as reviewing them and doing stuff with that uh, once I, you know, figure everything out. And yeah. I don't have much space in my office. I ran into the wall with my arm one day and I'm like, all right, that's enough. <laughs> uh, but uh, once I get a little bit more space, I'll be doing that. Yeah. But I really think that um, we say it's the future because we've heard that for 15 years. Yeah. Oh, this is the future. This is what's going to be like in the future. And this is AR and this is VR. So uh, for, for, for those of you who don't know what AR, augmented reality, uh, many museums are starting to embrace that quicker than virtual reality because it's cheaper. And uh, you can literally scan a QR code and someone pops up and it's AR based. Mm -hmm. um, virtual reality being that next step, which takes more time and more money to do a lot of it. However, as we go forward, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, just like anything else, it's going to become cheaper to create. And then we're going to see an explosion of this stuff where you're actually playing like something like Assassin's Creed in virtual reality as the character and, and stuff. So I, I think that's going to really pique the interest of a lot of young historians and middle aged historians, older historians who the, the flame might have gone out or they are upset that, you know, they didn't get as far uh, in their journey as a historian as they wanted. And now they have something new to look forward to. Uh, my thoughts on, on VR, though, it's one of those deals where we can sit here and play World of Warships all night or, or whatever else. And that's great. But there's so much more than that kind of an experience that we can really um, embrace as mm -hmm. historians. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, I also sometimes wonder, or I've started to wonder lately that maybe there are things that I don't know if games, uh, especially VR should, um, recreate, you know what I mean? Like some, sometimes I wonder like, like with the, the civil war games, right. That I grew up playing, like they're, you know, the, the, one of the reasons that they left out the disease is a, because they needed it to be fun and disease for for a bunch of reasons disease is not fun. not fun yeah as we all know from living through covid right right but um uh b is because the you know the game was primarily like intended for kids and you know you don't want to show kids like a gangrene stump right on every every character so i don't know so, so i wonder if there's like a line that um uh shouldn't be like mm -hmm reality if that makes sense i don't know absolutely yeah i I, I, I totally agree yeah uh with that because there there are things in history you wouldn't want 
mm -hmm. be, to have in VR because it would seem more like you're going for the shock value. Yeah. Which, which was that, that, like you just said, like if you had someone there with a gangrenous stump or something mm -hmm. like that, that's more of like going for the shock value than uh, touring through Independence Hall. Yeah. You know, in July of 1776 or, or, or something like that. I think there has to be a line there. Mm -hmm. This is why we don't have, you know, uh, this is why we don't have games that involve the Holocaust. Right. Or, you know, or we shouldn't have games that involve the Holocaust, but sometimes some people like to push that line for the shock value. Um, I think it's the same with VR. I think it's in that same vein, right, where uh, in some ways it might be good to have that grotesque battlefield kind of experience right. for some people because they think it's too clean, you know, or they think of it too cleanly, right. um, you know. And, and not and, authentic, right, because there's not yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they 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 see it for the video game nature, and they're like, "Oh, this is easy." Yeah, you know, and it, for those people, it might be a little bit better to have something like that. Mm -hmm. However, I think that it it's a really interesting way to look at history, in that there are some things that we can talk about through our research and through our papers and books that shouldn't be seen in in VR, at least in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and I, I tend to agree. And I think you know, I'm like uh, tomorrow, I'm teaching. Um, about slavery in my um, Civil War and Reconstruction class. And slavery is uh, a hard topic and it's, uh, you know, an important topic, but for, for a lot of people, slavery is personal, it's painful because mm -hmm. they have family members not too long in the past that went through it, right? And so I don't know if that's something that I would be as a historian comfortable with having turned into virtual reality. Um, so as much as there's a huge promise for VR and, and AR, I think with any, you know, like with anything that are also, um, Things that you should and should not do, if that makes sense. Mm. But yeah, I, I totally agree. And and the other point that I wanted to make sure we talked about this evening, Jonathan, was mm. how game developers and gaming in general, is it the games that we play, mm. can impact us. Uh, you know, when we're not even playing, and that. Mm. And for me, um, I'm going to be at uh, Aquino Tank Fest in a week and a half in uh, Ontario and it is sponsored by World of Tanks. Nice. So these developers are now helping to put on historical events yeah. where you can go out and you can see the stuff like you would see in the game. And I think that's really the next real step where you can have that experience and they, they can plug what they need to plug and they can network and you can network with them. Yeah. But now you're starting to see the stuff that you're using in game in real life. Uh, so it kind of goes with virtual reality, but then it also goes into reality, yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, like, but they're, uh -huh. but they're influencing the events in our real world now. Yeah. It's like, if you go to the toy section in a store, you see like Fortnite uh, guns and stuff, right? Like my nephew yeah. just, just got his, like a, not, not a real gun, but like a foam, you know, <laughs> Fortnite. Uh, you are from Texas. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Texas is an interesting place. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he so like, you know, I went to visit and there was this Fortnite gun in real life that, you know, used to only be in Fortnite. So I totally know what you mean. And that's wild, right? Um, it's kind of like when, um, like, uh, I don't know, like, they're, like Amazon uh, is starting to like, think about maybe making department stores after, yeah. <laughs> after like putting department stores out of, out of business. And it's like that crossover territory right <laughs> yeah it's a, wild, it's a wild world of history right now history and video games right things are rapidly uh changing and, and going forward yeah i i'm i want to see how these gaming developers and games in general impact us in real life at events like the one i'm going to go to yeah uh are there going to be events like that at university campuses where you're introducing something and now it's there. I also know that the the people who, uh, the developers of World of Warships, they sometimes go on actual warships and do gaming days and stuff like that. So you're actually walking around a warship and you can go to this one section of the ship and play World of Warships. Nice. So I'm really liking that because it's bringing together two uh, different families of, you know, this thought process where it's like, hey, it's the game and it's in the game. But now you're seeing younger uh, 
students who may not realize that they're talking about history who are now walking around a ship saying, oh, this is the this is the bridge and this is this and this is that, not realizing it, it's it's almost tricking them into understanding history, which I'm for. I don't care. And they thought history was boring, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the idea of sitting on board a World War II ship and playing World of Warships all day. I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to in the future, Jonathan, as far as uh, gaming and how we uh, perceive the past or or how we just connect gaming with what we're learning uh, in the primary sources or in the in the classroom? Yeah, I think um, like, like, you know, one of the main points that we've been making is that I want to see more and more people use games in the classroom, mm -hmm. right, to, to like actually teach people because I guarantee you 90%, you know, for anybody that's teaching in, in any context, whether it's in an elementary school or in a grad program, you know, 90% of your students at least play games, like have played games within the last 24 hours. So using using games whether it's just as a connection point to like bring up something, you know, some kind of content in history to talk about, or whether it's a VR thing to show like the Declaration of Independence getting signed or whatever, I would love to see more uh, of that. And I expect to see more. I know there are folks out there um, teaching uh, really cool uh, history courses using games. So I like I like that. That's what I want to see. And I hope to one day do one of one of those on my own. Um, but that's a topic for, for another time. It's tough to do though, because, you know, every classroom has different kinds of technology, right? And so every, um, it, it's tough to like physically pull off something like that. And, you know, it's almost like, um, I think sometimes people are afraid to assign video games to their students in the same way that they would assign movies because they feel like that would make their students go out and buy uh, a, a PS4 or whatever, or a PS5. Um, I just dated myself there. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. We can't find the PS5. So, it's yeah, right. it's, so you're stuck with the PS4 anyways. But yeah. yeah, but but you don't have to do that. If you want to assign, um, you know, game footage is all over YouTube. It's all over Twitch, right? So um, uh, there's just like pragmatic things that that I think if more people were um, aware of, of how much game content is already out there without actually having to play the games, that it would help bring more games in, into the classroom. But that's kind of my that's kind of my um, spiel these days. Yeah, and we're also starting to see more of this discussion at actual conferences. Yeah, not just the conference that we did, but actual conferences, uh, meaning multiple conferences. It's starting to catch on that uh, historians are gaming anyway. How are we connecting the historical narrative with the games that we are doing with an audience or with our students? Yeah. And that's where I'm starting to see the mainstream start to pick up on it a little bit. There was, there's always going to be pushback from all strata of the history field, yeah. but that's with anything, right? It's just that's anything about pushback. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not concerned. I, I have the hate mail. It's it's fine. That's <laughs> that's whatever. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but yeah, I have plenty of the mail saying you're ruining history and all that stuff. But whatever. Yeah. Um, no matter what it is, you know, it's, I, I got that because I live streamed and it's like, oh, okay. And now everybody's doing it. Right. Um, <laughs> but I am really interested to see uh, how that transitions into real world use yeah. of, of video gaming, not, not gamification, video gaming itself. Right. And uh, we're starting to see this on panels. Mm -hmm. I want to see it on more panels uh, going forward. Um, and and I think that's going to lead to greater understanding because we're going to have to study it and we're going to have to come up with data and numbers mm -hmm. to back up what we're saying. And then uh, putting it into some kind of real world exercise would be really interesting for the pedagogy of the classroom. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And there's I should I should also add that there's um, historians out there who have written and published recently, like some really cool history of video games books and, and articles and stuff. So if anybody's interested in the history of games, both like how game how video games evolved, but also the kinds of content that gets put in video games and what doesn't, there's cool, cool books that you can read um, out there. Um, for some reason, I feel like um, that the, the, the kinds of people that are writing those kinds of books and like teaching those kinds of classes tend to be in Europe and the UK. I don't know why um, historians living in the US are kind of latecomers to this, me included too. But um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I just got I was just contacted uh, 
earlier this week by uh, a publishing house in Berlin who has been doing extensive research on this very topic. Yeah. And uh, they've put out a couple books and they also have a journal. Nice. And uh, they want to send me like, you know, some ideas for in the future. And it's like, okay, I have to go, like I have to be published through a Berlin publishing house to get this done because we don't have, we're not there yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So I get it when you say it's, it's mainly European focused, uh, European centric right now. Uh, we'll catch up, but it's like, okay, I gotta, yeah. I gotta go through the Germans right now, which is fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, and, and see how that goes. But it is definitely out there where they're like, how, how are you as historians connecting with people on different platforms for the historical narrative in gaming? Yeah. And there's some great stuff out there. Yeah. And I'll also say that a big, um, you know, historians like communicate with each other through journals. That's how we like argue and, and debate. And the two, two, among other ways, right? Yeah. Also <laughs> there's also Twitter. Emails and on Twitter and, you know, but yeah. the official way is through, <laughs> through mean journal articles. Right. Yes. But you can, uh, the two big, two of the biggest, um, history journals around in the two big ones in, in US history, um, the American Historical Review and the Journal of American History are both now this year starting to do video game reviews, like reviews oh, of historical video games. Um, wow. uh, uh, AHR, the American Historical Review just put out um, a couple of reviews on Assassin's Creed. And those, so like you can Google those and, and read what historians who have played those games think of the content in the games. So wow. JAH will soon have one. I'm, I'm doing one for JAH on um, Red Dead Redemption 2. So you can see what I think of cholera in, in Red Dead. Nice. <laughs> it's, it's, a big, it's a big moment, right? It's like yeah. an official, um, you know, video games are here. They're in the journals now even. So it's like they're coming back into the real, the real world, if you can call higher ed the real world. <laughs> right. So that means you can wear like your Red Dead Redemption two yeah, shirt to the conference, sure. <laughs> you know. It is no, that's fantastic. Dress code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I maybe maybe I can write something for one of them someday. Uh, that'd be that'd be awesome because I'm always on here doing something. I just got to get the contacts to figure out who needs what. Um, but Jonathan, I really do appreciate your time, my friend. It's great to have you on here talking about this really cool topic and especially here on Twitch. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's great to catch up. We'll have to do this again soon. This was a blast. And thanks. I'm, I'm glad so many people are in here watching uh, and yeah. chatting with us. Yeah, I'm glad everybody showed up uh, here on Twitch. We are growing this channel slowly but surely. Uh, but this is a great place to come talk about history in the chat if you're into it. Um, and if you're into historical gaming, like we've been talking about here with uh, Jonathan, with uh, Red Dead and with uh, going old school with Oregon Trail and some other stuff with Assassin's Creed, uh, this is one place where you can come and talk about it. There's only about 10 other historians on Twitch right now, so there's not many of us. So, uh, you know, you don't have a lot to choose from just yet, but I'm sure sooner or later there's going to be a genre uh, of history here on Twitch, so you can just get history content. I hope so. Um, I'll write a letter, <laughs> see if <laughs> see if Jeff Bezos will do that for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but no, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here again. I really do appreciate your time, and I hope you can you'll come back soon. Definitely, yeah. I had a blast, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I really appreciate you all.